Stay tuned because we're talking to someone who teaches parenting classes next on Fathers Are Parents Too. <laughs> to Fathers or Parents too. We're here this week with Kate Brill, and she is the manager of a parenting class program in San Jose, California. Welcome to the show, Kate. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Parenting class, why? I mean, why would I need to learn how to parent if, if I have a child? Obviously, I should know how to be a mom, right? Don't get me started. <laughs> um, everybody seems to have that attitude these days, and our parents had it, our grandparents had it. Um, but there are a number of reasons people should have parent education, regardless of their family situation, whether it's intact or not. Um, society has become extremely stressful. Mm -hmm. Kids are learning about sex and drugs uh, earlier and earlier and earlier. Um, most people are, uh, families are divorced, divorcing, separated, um, single parents. Uh, most parents work, and our society is not at all like it was 25, 50 years ago um, when parenting in the 50s kind of got invented, the mm -hmm. Ozzie and Harriet style, you know, mom's home in the apron and dad goes out to work. When that kind of parenting got kind of promoted in the media in the 50s, um, we're not that way anymore in the 90s, and we couldn't be further from it. So people really don't know what to do. I personally learned how to parent from those shows, Ozzie and Harriet. Mm -hmm. I mean, as a little girl growing up watching those shows. Right, right. And not any of that information has been transferable or useful in any way, shape, or form. Um, and both my parents worked, um, so I think people need a tremendous amount of support today for parenting, and I think they always have. Um, but today more than ever. So now I imagine that a lot of the parents who come to your classes are, as you said, either already divorced or in the process of divorcing or have been divorced and are remarried, but at some point uh, the, the disintegration of their family unit has occurred and there have been children involved. Is that accurate? Yeah, we serve parents uh, in any, families in any conglomeration, intact, single, uh, step families, uh, grandparents parenting, is there one common theme that tends to run through all of the family configurations, except for perhaps original intact families, um, one common what they really need to know and get in terms of what's going on for the kids? Yes, regardless of the stress level, regardless of whether the families are intact or not intact, um, parenting involves a tremendous amount of uh, listening and making time for. Um, we're beginning to realize that uh, quality time, unfortunately, has turned out to be a myth, that parenting does require time, uh, time and energy and attention. And, and how do you affect that if you are, as even intact families, as you said, your own parents, where both parents are out working? How, how can you compensate or achieve the balance when, as in many states now, you really need both parents to be working full time? What, how do you tell people to address that problem? Well, it does usually involve some sacrifice. Um, if you're working full time and you're also parenting, uh, many parents today are giving up active social lives. Mm -hmm. They're giving up um, participating in a lot of uh, things that they would normally like to participate in if they had no children. Mm -hmm. uh, it's coming down to there's work and there's home, and any energy that's left after that can be used for other things. But for many people, that's it. That's all they have energy for. And they're lucky if they have energy for for home too, especially if they have energy draining jobs, which most people do too. Now when you're talking about a family that is in the process of divorcing or a disunited family, when I think of parenting even between parents who no longer live together, I think of some form of interaction and what I would call co-parenting, and yet there are a lot of parents out there who are maybe in the middle of divorce who can barely stand a look at each other. I have to imagine that that's very 
destructive and very uh, emotionally harmful for a child. And do you address that in these classes? And do you, are you able to give them practical advice as to how to minimize the damage done to their kids if they just yeah. can't bear the sight of each other? Yeah. What do you, what do you tell these people? Um, uh, it is ideal if you are able to be friendly with your ex or the partner that you're not going to be staying with. That's uh, optimal. Um, but in many cases, that's not possible. Um, one of the one of the jokes that we have in our single parenting classes is that uh, everyone, regardless of the circumstances of their divorce or separation, everyone would categorize their spouse or ex as mentally ill. <laughs> so I mean, most people just most people cannot do it with their partner. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the reason they got divorced in the first place. And to ask them then to be united for the rest of their lives to parent is very often, you're, you're literally asking the impossible. So um, that is a gigantic problem. And what we try to do to support the parents is to let them know that both you and your spouse are feeling the same things, the intensity of the emotions, mm -hmm. the intensity of the pain, the intensity, just the intensity, period. You and your spouse are feeling that. Whether you can have compassion for that or not, that doesn't make any difference. You're both feeling it. Now, your kids are also feeling it. That intensity, that emotion, that conflict, your kids are feeling it too. No matter how terribly painful your situation is with your spouse or ex-spouse or partner, um, you must think about the child. It, it, for one example I like to use is a car wreck. If you and your spouse and your child are in a car wreck, um, you must also deal with your child who's been in this car wreck. You can't just pay attention to yourself and your spouse. Mm -hmm. And for many people, emotionally, this whole um, breaking up the family is very much like a car wreck. Uh, and it's a milestone in every person's, each person's life um, that it can't be denied. It, you can't go back to before it. You simply have to learn how to cope and go forward. So I try to encourage people to know that it is like a car wreck for the child and you have to treat it as such. It's not going to just go away. Um, it's, not, it's going to be something that the child's going to need to talk about really for the rest of their lives. And this is true even of people whose parents are getting divorced when they're in their 30s or 40s or 50s. There are, uh, you know, I have a number of friends whose parents are getting divorced and we're all in our early 40s and they're traumatized. Wow. Wow. So, we, we really have to be sensitive as a culture to that this is what's going on. We usually don't give people compassion unless they have a real discernible handicap. Right. Their arms in a sling right. or they're on crutches. Uh, but so many people are walking around society uh, completely emotionally devastated and wounded. Um, and we, we must be sensitive to that. It's a reality. Um, I liken it to war. 25, 50 years ago, we dealt with wars. And that's the force that was impacting families at that time. The men were going to war. The men were coming home from war. Um, when the men were home from war, they were either functional or non-functional. Mm, and uh, the war was the, the major impact on people's uh, mental and emotional well-being and the family. Uh, these days, there's not a war. You know, the Gulf War came up and went down. but. Uh, it wasn't like Vietnam, it wasn't like World War II, World War I. Right. Uh, and nowadays, people's conflicts within the home, the conflicts between men and women, are, is the war zone. And, um, and the kids are the ones that get caught in the Yeah, they're fire. simply right. innocent human beings who got born into it, who, who bear the consequences. And I don't say that to make people feel guilty. I just say that because it is a reality. My husband and I were separated for... Uh, an entire year and we were going towards divorce and it just happened in our case that we didn't end up in that situation but um, we all bear the marks my son is nine now it happened when he was five and uh, he bears the marks he has trouble with transitions trouble trusting that people are going to be where they say they're going to be um, you know clinginess that a nine-year-old should have grown out of by now so the stress is, is very real. It's, it's post-traumatic stress 
syndrome. Only being manifested in little people, which is, yes. is even worse. Now, you mentioned, uh, you know, that ideally the parents need to be able to communicate. Sometimes that's not possible, and right. sometimes there's no communication, I imagine, between parents. What about parents who actually aren't able to interface with their children? Is there anything that you can offer them? Uh, a lot of times we see fathers, for example, maybe the mom's moved out of state, or for some reason they aren't able to have timeshare with the kids at all. Yeah. Um, and yet, they're still parents. Oh, and absolutely. Do you see people yeah. like that, and what, uh, what can you offer them? Yes. Well, the one good piece of news is your influence as a parent is not at all correlated to how much time you spend with your child. And I mean your influence. And I'll give an example. Um, my father's father um, uh, was divorced and left his family when my father was two or three. Wow. And he had literally no contact with his father, you know, an occasional thing, every, maybe every five years they'd have a, a quick visit, but really no parenting took place. And that was my father's father's choice. Um, but for my father, my father's life has really been emotionally dominated by his father. And the influence his father had on him was that he was not present. So my father went on, he's perfectly okay. functional, he's got a PhD, you know, I mean, he fabulously functional man but when you ask him about his father his face falls and he talks about the father he would have liked to know and the father that he didn't know so he had a father and his father influenced him and that's the influence he had so you can change that you can impact that by whatever influence you can do you can write letters mm -hmm. you can tape uh, you can make ta monthly, weekly tape recordings of your voice, mm -hmm. uh, send it, you can send pictures. Your child will know if you're trying to establish a relationship. They will know. They'll know if you're not also. Mm -hmm. So if you're feeling depressed and you're sitting back and not doing anything because you're in despair, your child will pick up that you're not relating with them. Even if you are depressed and in despair and the situation is not good, you can still stockpile things, stockpile Christmas presents, stockpile tapes of your voice, stockpile uh, scrapbooks, and whenever you get time to be with that child, deliver. Deliver all that stuff, and your child will know. And he'll, I mean, in the back, if, if that had happened with my father, he would be able to say now, well, we didn't have a relationship, but he really, you know, he really tried his best in these circumstances to create a legacy for me, and he delivered it to the extent that he could. So isn't it actually true now that I'm thinking about it that children who have one parent removed, sometimes even through death, yes. still maintain a fantasy that Absolutely. sometime they're going to ride back in on a white horse into their life and say, here I was all these years, I really wanted yes. to be with you. So it sounds like what you're saying yes. is if you make that fantasy come true even years later, you will still have an impact because you'll have fulfilled that and the child will still feel that connection again. Absolutely. Have you actually seen that happen? Yeah. Have you ever had that opportunity to be involved with that? Can you tell us about that? Well, um, personally, just from my father's point of view, uh, he didn't have a reconciliation with his father at all. His father died and they were apart and had been apart for many years. Just recently, my father was found on the internet by uh, his father's la last wife, mm -hmm. and she conveyed to him that his father loved him. Mm. And that very simple thing, it, it, my father shared that it, it just felt like an injection of love in, straight into his heart. Wow. Uh, and it oh, is things, <laughs> yeah, kids long for it. Yeah. So even if you don't think it'll make any difference, it really, really will. And at any point, no matter how old you are, no matter how much time you haven't seen them for. And again, sometimes, especially with teenagers, teenagers may not receive that well. Uh, teenagers are, you know, a breed unto themselves where if you do try and come and make a relationship with them where there has been none, you may be up against a major wall. But if you learn about teenagers and the specific mechanics of their mind, um, you can create a relationship with them too. They're just a little bit more difficult than all the other ages because all the other ages are a little bit more mellow. Now we only have about a minute left before we have to go to a break, but I'm wondering because you're talking about these different ages, do you see, is there sort of a larger population of kids at certain ages that tend to be the ones that these parents are coming in? Is there any correlation? Do you mostly have parents of very little kids or older kids or? 
Well, um, right now, most people who are being court ordered to take our parenting classes because they're in the custody disputes or uh, divorce proceedings, uh, their young child, young children, toddlers uh, through preschool, their school age, and their teen. So, so you really get a good mix. Yeah, I imagine it's better if they're mix. younger because you can get them earlier on. Yeah. We have to take a break, and when we come back, we have some questions from you, from, for you from the audience. Okay. okay, we'll be right back. Thank you. I'm a dad and a member of FREE, the Father's Rights and Equality Exchange. Most dads out there would love to spend more time with their kids, to be a real part of their lives. FREE wants to change the notion that all divorced dads are irresponsible because most of us are dads who are responsible and we're working for a chance to share the parenting. If you want to learn more, please call us at 1-500-4-DADS. That's 1-500-4-DADS. And remember, fathers are parents too. Welcome back to Fathers Are Parents Too. We're here today with our guest, Kate Brill, and she is the manager of a parenting education program. And we have some questions from the audience for Kate. Yes. Yes, yes, Ms. Brill. Uh, you said a lot of your uh, students are court referred, and, and I assume that means that they, they were sent to you rather than they came to you. And how, in that sort of circumstance, do you, you get over the tension and, and and, and get them to listen? That's a great question. We serve people who are self-referred, where they are people who just want to take a parenting class and it's, they generate it. And we serve parents who have been sent to us specifically by uh, family court services or social services. Um, I personally use the traffic school mode uh, with my classes of court referred clients, which meaning I went to traffic school one day and really had a blast and learned a lot from the uh, traffic school uh, teacher about making classes fun even though no one would have normally chosen to be there. So we use a lot of humor. Um, I tell people that I was not court ordered to take parenting classes, but I should have been. I tell people I think everyone should be court ordered to take parenting classes. I'd like to see a law passed, have a baby take a parenting class, that's the law. Um, so I, I tell them that I, I consider that they're really lucky that they got kind of forced to do a parenting class because um, they're going to learn some things that maybe a lot of people would be too proud to uh, want to learn. Um, so, and there's a lot of humor, a lot of support group atmosphere. Um, we're all in the same boat. Everybody's suffering to some degree. So uh, we, we try to make it fun. And that may be surprising that it can be fun, but it really does turn out that we can have some fun. That's super. I think we have another question for you. Yes. Uh, yes, I've got a uh, question. When, the, when you have children in a divorced uh, uh, situation and they live in two different homes, how do you advise the parents when they have two distinct different uh, life's philosophies and parenting styles? Uh, is there some way where you can bring those together to a, uh, uh, you know, a more universal form? Yeah, what a great question. That's a very common worry that parents have. Um, there's two situations. In the optimal situation, maybe both parents would take a parenting class and uh, learn the same skills and then be able to use the same skills in both homes. That would sure be optimal. But in many cases, that's not possible. So what we support parents in who don't have that optimal situation is focus on being the best parent you can be. That's all you have control over. That's all your job is. Uh, very often parents worry if I'm providing this reality over here and there's this other reality over there, won't my child be confused? Won't? And they really worry about that. Um, but the truth is once your child is older, past the teens, your child will be able to look back on both styles of parenting in both households and your child will make a choice which felt better and they'll live the way that they choose based on the two different models they got so if you both model similar things that's optimal if you both if you each model totally different things your child will just have uh, some choices to make later on and they will likely choose the model that felt better to them that felt more healthy so you're a critical model, even if your partner is not cooperative at all. 
And what about the skills, as you said, that you give these parents? Do they actually replace styles that they might have themselves? Or could I go to a parenting class and still not lose my individuality as a parent and still use, is it sort of like you've given me tools that I incorporate into my own style? Yeah. Or? Yeah, we, I like to think that parenting is more of an art than a science. That there are skills that you can learn, uh, just like teachers learn certain skills, but they still retain their own personality. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Jeez, I froze on that one. Yeah. Oh well, uh, should I take the next question or should sure. I? Sure, I think we one? do have another question okay. actually for you. Hi. Hi. Um, I was wondering, you know, are there certain children that have a more difficult time dealing with the co-parenting situation that may need some, you know, special special management? For example, a child with ADHD or somebody who's got a learning disability. And, and does your do your courses come across with some uh, information and, and guidance on that? Yes, that happens to be my son as well. He has ADD and dyslexia. Uh, and we do have classes specifically for parenting children with special needs. Um, so that would be a separate course to take where everybody deals with those special needs. Um, but for my son specifically, yes, it made it a lot harder. Um, for example, our, my best friend who got a divorce, her son doesn't have any learning disabilities, doesn't have, uh, he's kind of um, an achiever at school. And to a certain extent, he can cope with the pain that he's going through by achieving at school. Uh, and that can kind of give him uh, something to hold on to, like a life raft to float with. Um, people with ADD or learning disabilities, like my son, they don't have that life raft. They can't go to school and really succeed and forget about all their problems. So they need more emotional support. Thank you. Yes. Hi. Hi. I'd like to ask if you had just a couple minutes to advise a father who was a non-custodial father and had very little time with his child, and you just had a couple minutes to kind of give him some advice about how to best use the time that he has with his child, what would you say? Um, number one, from wherever you are, if you are loving your child and making a conscious intention and a conscious effort to love your child, your child will know that. That's for the time when you are apart. Um, you can do many things. To You can collect scrapbooks, collect uh, cassette tapes to uh, give your child, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and when you're with your child, it's very important to be with your child with no expectations. Uh, some parents look forward so hard to the time they have together that their expectations make them very uh, agitated and make the child agitated during their visits. So you have to be very careful to just let go of any expectations you have about the child's behavior uh, and about your relationship when you're together. And just be with the child like getting to know each other, newly, every single time, just getting to know each other. We have another question for you. Yes. Uh, if I wish to take a parenting class uh, from you, how do I get a hold of you? We're at the YWCA in downtown San Jose. We're in the phone book, the Yellow Pages, um, but our phone number is 408-295-4011. If you call the YWCA and ask for parenting classes, you will uh, be put with me or my assistants. Now, a lot of people watching this show are in other states or in other parts of California or even on the East Coast. Are you aware of, does, do other wise in other cities offer this class or are yeah. there other, um, are there other places, other uh, perhaps networks you're aware of? And also, if someone in, in a town where they don't offer a parenting class is watching and would want one, would they be able to call you or someone at your facility to sort of brainstorm about how they might import your program or, yeah. or model your program in their city? Yes. Luckily, this is a good time in the United States. A lot of people are doing parent education throughout the United States. So it's always good to check YMCA's, YWCA's, schools and churches. Uh, also, adult education uh, establishments very often have classes, too. Um, the program that we used is a program called STEP, Systematic Training for Effective Parenting. And that book is sold nationwide as well. You can order it from any bookstore. Um, 
other than that, if you contact us, we can certainly refer you to other places. In that case, if you want to, why don't you give the number again and also how you're listed so people can call from across the country. Okay. It's the YWCA of the Santa Clara Valley. The phone number is 408-295-4011. You could dial extension 214 to get directly to our department. Okay, we have just a couple of minutes left, and I'm going to give you the impossible task of asking you in that short period of time to address what do you say to parents about the, the issues and the dynamics involved when one parent says things about the other parent in front of the child, because I know that's a really big issue. I'm sure you must address that, right? Yes. Um, can you just in, in a minute or two tell us yes. sort of the overview on that? Yes. In our parenting classes, we go to great pains to let people know that if you are talking badly about the other parent, you are talking badly about the child. The child knows the child is made up of a mother and a father and two people. So if one party is bad-mouthing the other, uh, you're bad-mouthing the child and, and their makeup. So it, it is devastating to the child's self-esteem. So we make sure we tell people just don't even think about doing it. Um, there are some situations where you simply can't control that. The other party is not cooperating. Uh, if that is the case, you can say to your child, if they let you know, if your child shares with you, well, mom or dad says such and such about you, you can say, gee, I'm sorry, I'm sorry that that kind of conversation about me is, is getting told to you. I would prefer that that not happen. That must be very confusing for you. Uh, if there's anything that gets brought up that you're confused about, that you want to check with me about, go right ahead. I personally am not going to be doing that about your, your other parent, just because I think that's real confusing for you. That's, so, that's amazing, because I was listening and I didn't hear you say anything negative in response about the other parent who had started it, which is... You're modeling it. You're modeling not getting into the warfare. And again, your child will notice that later in life. You know, uh, mom bashed dad, but you know, dad never bashed mom. Gee, what a great guy. You're getting point. You'll get points later in life if you abstain. I think that's that's really an important lesson too, and something that I, um, in my own practice, try to tell people. And of course, it's hard to hang on to that when you're in the middle of it. But if you always try to take that moral high ground, yes. eventually your child will become an adult and they are going to look back and they're going to see that uh, you know that you did that as you said that you offered the model that was the more comfortable and healthy one right and always offer them the opportunity if mom says anything that you're confused about let me know not that we're spying on what gets said but that I can give you my perspective and my reality on it okay in about five seconds if you could have a slogan out there across the airways which you can why people should take a parenting class what would you say um, there was a comic strip that said, Mom, how do you get involved in this parenting business? And Mom said, well, you just have a child. And the child said, that's it, no classes, no training. And the mom said, that's it, no classes, no training, you just do it. And the child said, well, that's like learning how to swim uh, by being thrown in the deep end, isn't it? That's pretty much it. Kate, thank you so much for being here. And thank you all for joining us. And thank you, audience. And we'll see you next week right here on Fathers Are Parents Too. Thank <laughs> you.